All right, welcome back. I hope you had a good spring break. <clears throat> um, on the Thursday before spring break, we started talking about legged robots, and I gave you some of my favorite examples of the simple models of legs. We talked about the rimless wheel, the compass gate, and uh, the rimless wheel is maybe the last system we'll completely understand that has legs, um, and I hope it was insightful sort of for that reason. But obviously we want to get to more interesting and more complicated robots. <clears throat> there are some different things that happen, but some pretty simple models that can, we can think about for running robots. And uh, I think there are, there are more lessons to learn about the, the fundamental dynamics of locomotion that we can see through these running models. So I want to spend a little time doing the simple models of running today. So um, you might ask, you know, you might think, I would have thought that uh, running would be a harder thing for a robot to do than walking. But actually, if you look back through the history, uh, in some sense, the running robots happened before the walking robots. Uh, if you, at least if you're willing to count the hopping robots as running robots, which is, I'll try to argue throughout the lecture today that that's actually a pretty reasonable model, simple model of running, is you're bouncing on a pogo stick, okay? So the, these pogo stick robots, which I showed you a little bit in the first lecture, and I'll, we'll talk a, with some details today, um, those happened in the early 80s, right? And by contrast, the passive dynamic walker I showed you last time, remember the date was 1989 or 1990 was when these passive walkers started happening. And the humanoids that were, the, 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 you know, the walking robots were very clunky around 1980 and not that much better by 1990. But Raybert and, other, and you know, had these robots flying through the air doing pretty impressive stunts in the early 80s. So somehow, running turned out to be a little bit easier, maybe, than, than walking. And there's a couple reasons for that. I think practically, um, running is more, it seems to be more about sort of the ballistics of your center of mass, right? And a little bit less about the complicated interaction with the ground. For instance, it seems to be that you need sort of more articulated leg which is a harder thing to build, you know, to, to, to walk well. But you could build a pogo stick with just a few degrees of freedom and get it running pretty convincingly, right? So that was sort of one reason. Um, but somehow, I, I think this idea of depending less on what the ground is doing to me, because I have only intermittent uh, opportunities to interact with the ground, maybe in a conceptual way made that, that made running easier. All right, so let's dig in. So let me first start off by defining running. You might think it's obvious, but actually there's a couple of competing definitions, right? So um, what would you, how would you define running? What would, if, you, if you were to watch an animal or a robot, what, what would you say, uh, you know, if that's running or that's not running? Moving forward, and both feet are off the ground at the same time. So right. So the existence of an aerial phase is one candidate. Right. If both feet get off the, or all feet, if you were talking about um, you know, quadruped, for instance, if all feet are off the ground at the same time, that's a pretty good. Uh, definition for running. In fact, it was it, some of the history of running is very interesting. Do you guys know who Moybridge is? Edward Moybridge, anybody? He was a photographer, um, pretty interesting guy. I think he was possibly a felon, maybe a murderer, but um, did some amazing photography, um, you know, spent some time in jail. Uh, he, so I, apparently, he was one of the first people that uh, really confirmed that a horse, when running uh, around a track, actually has an aerial phase. And he was, he, was, he was one of the inventors of sort of high-speed photography. And actually, the reason he used his high-speed photography to study animals was apparently because Leland Stanford commissioned him to study the horses so he could w decide a bet. Okay, so the, you know, the guy who started Stanford University uh, hired Moybridge to study horses um, and, and uh, he confirmed with high-speed photography that actually, uh, you know, horses do have an aerial phase during gallop. 
right? And all the four feet are off the ground. But before that, with the naked eye, it was very hard to confirm absolutely, and people would, would argue about whether that was actually true. So by the aerial phase definition, this is clearly a run, running gate, right? Um, it's actually, Muybridge has some great um, books uh, of just, with just plates and plates of these images of all kinds of different humans and animals of all, um, of all varieties showing their gates. It's, it's actually fascinating. Uh, very, very, a huge contribution to the field. But that's actually not the only definition of running. It can be more subtle than that. Yeah? Smaller contact area than walking. Well, so that's a relative, but where would you draw the threshold? Where would you draw the line? Yeah? I mean, I, <clears throat> somehow the second one is about the exchange of kinetic energy and potential energy, okay? So in walking, our simple models of walking, um, we had the center of mass traveling sort of over like a pole vault, right? And so therefore, you're gaining potential energy over stance, and going back down, right? And for running, we're going to see that the center of mass takes a characteristically different trajectory, and the leg actually shortens. So think of it as a prismatic leg, maybe with a spring or something in between, okay? There's a fundamental flip in the side of what you're doing with your potential energy during stance, okay? You're going to store energy in your leg and come back off. So, you know, this, the, the, um, the sign of your potential energy during stance is another sort of characteristic uh, that can define running. And oddly, you know, you can do this without actually having an aerial phase. Maybe the fam most famous example of that is Groucho Marx running, or at least for old people, you know, like me or whatever. I guess, uh, you know, anybody remember Groucho Marx and, uh, and how he runs? Yeah? So Groucho would run, but without a, an aerial phase, right? And there's... You know, I guess people still do that at CrossFit or something, you know, like the Groucho running or something uh, for exercise. But you can, you can actually have a, a running gait without leaving the ground, if you so chose, by that second definition. Actually, one of my favorite examples, um, there was a, there's a guy, um, Hutchinson, he's written some great papers. He's at the Veterinary Institute in, um, in London. And uh, he's written some great papers about dinosaurs and what, how they must have locomoted based on basic mechanics and stuff like this. He also studied elephants. So um, if you, what do you think an elephant does? Elephants can actually run, by, maybe by that second definition. And it's pretty impressive when they do. Here's a, what it looks like if you put motion capture markers on an elephant and convince it to get going. Okay. But the, so they move pretty fast, let me say. And then the question is, do they walk or do they run in that? So I don't, they never, never actually have an aerial phase. But by that second definition, you can ask, do they walk or do they run? And interestingly, the paper that they wrote here, which was, I believe it was in Nature, um, the very nice paper, but the center of mass didn't follow the sort of characteristic trajectory that we see in a lot of animals. But they found out that if they think about the front half of the elephant and the back half of the elephant differently, then you sort of, it's sort of like there's two big heavy things moving along. And uh, let me make sure I get it right. So the front legs walk and the back legs run is what happens in that particular gait. So you know, there's, every permutation is possible, right? Front legs walk, the back legs run. Yeah. Okay. So it's a, you know it's, it's slightly more subtle than that. Um, <clears throat> but actually, this definition here, and in fact, this model here, of a leg that is storing energy during stance and then exploding off the ground, you can imagine this looks a lot like the pogo stick hopping robots that Raybert built. And this turns out to be our first and most most important simple model for running. It's called the spring-loaded inverted pendulum. Not sure I went to caps there. So everybody always calls it slip. The slip model.
Now, interestingly, this, this connection here between um, you know, simple models and biology is one that we see a, we've seen a lot in running. Um, now, I think there are many virtues of these simple models. I think the first virtue is that they're simple enough that we can get a lot of mechanical intuition about them. We can solve sometimes in closed form for what they're going to do, ask qu fundamental questions about stability. So just like the analytical tractability of this is one clear motivation for simple models. I think the second one is that maybe because it's tractable, uh, there are a lot of nice sort of insights that we think generalize to the more complicated model um, that come out of these sort of mechanical insights. For instance, remember the, the one I gave at the end last time, which, is, which talked about if you're a biped, how can you be more energy efficient? by if you push off with your toe just at the moment before you strike, then you can take your center of your angular momentum about this point, which was originally, because you were a pendulum around this foot and you're about to land on this foot. So it started off going like this, but if I were to push just before um, touchdown, and I know after touchdown I'm gonna look like a, um, a pendulum around this, then I can actually shave a lot of energy and, and lose less energy, dissipate less energy into the ground just by pushing off with my toe. And that's an example that people have then experimentally demonstrated on more complicated robots as being a good idea. Right? But that's something that is just very simple to think about in the, in the compass gate models. But there's this third motivation that come, came up, comes up in running, which I really like and we haven't talked about yet, which is this... Um, this idea, Bob Full calls it comparative biology. And really the connection to simple models is if you can find a simple model that describes um, the behavior of animals, let's say, very different animals that can somehow be described by the same simple model, then maybe you found something fundamental about either the mechanics of locomotion or the neuromechanics of, of locomotion or something like this, um, you know, sort of, if you can find invariant in the data, like a simple model that works for many, maybe it's the sort of fundamental principles of locomotion. And this spring-loaded inverted pendulum actually got a lot more attention as this sort of fundamental principle of, of locomotion um, first before its virtues were completely appreciated in terms of the mechanics and the, and the analytics. And the reason for that is this um, Bob Full, who's a fantastic biologist at, uh, at Berkeley, he led a series of experiments showing <clears throat> that this spring, if you track the center of mass during locomotion of the of animals relative to a their, of, of with a single virtual leg. So if you have multiple legs on the ground, you take somehow the center of pressure of that that leg and call that a point. If you plot the mechanics of that point and the center of mass relative to it, then you can track the motion of these, and you can fit if it fits kinematically. You can fit a spring constant to that and, and see how well the spring-loaded inverted pendulum describes locomotion for many different animals. And it turns out that it's the, this scaled dimensionless sort of uh, stiffness scales incredibly, is con incredibly consistent across a huge variety of length scales from a cockroach, all you know, crabs, quails, humans, kangaroos, or whatever. It's uh, having relatively very different gaits it seems like all of these animals roughly have their center of mass go like this during stance and then have a little bit of a, you know, flight like this, okay? So there's actually a great amount of work in the, on, in the world of slip, spring-loaded vertebrate pendulum, about the biology of slip and the connections there. 
And the fourth maybe motivation for simple models that we see in robotics is as a template for higher degree of freedom robots. So there's, a, there's been a, a set of, of, of work, we'll talk a little bit about it in the humanoids lecture, uh, <clears throat> where if I want to make a complicated robot run stably, then a reasonable thing to do would be to spend my effort making my, all my, my joints, of my, you know, my fully actuated joints inside the leg, so that it moves my center of mass relative to my foot in this basic way. If you can embed the dynamics of a simple model in my big complicated model and make the complicated system act like the simple system, then you can potentially inherit some of the stability properties that we understand better about the simple model. Okay, so there's lots of good reasons to think about simple models. Cool. Um, okay, so let's dig in and start thinking about how we analyze this slip model. I'm going to have a, a mass here. We'll say its location in space is xy. Um, a springy leg, which has length, rest length L0 and current length L. Okay. We'll call this angle relative to the ground theta. And we'll give this spring in here a stiffness k. So the of course, there's gravity going down. Configuration of this thing is fully specified by x, y, and theta. Okay. Um, and then we're going to make some assumptions. First of all, we're going to assume that the leg is massless. Okay, so there's no mass at the toe in particular, but even the whole length of the leg. So that implies that I can, I can move, I can produce, I can basically move theta arbitrarily. That, you know, with zero effort, I can put the leg wherever I want. So I can basically command um, theta instantaneously. So when I'm in the air, the dynamics of the leg contributes absolutely nothing. When I'm in the ground, the leg is going to be at some place and uh, it won't be able to move relative to the ground, so I'm gonna, I will have interesting dynamics along the, at the ground. Okay? I'm going to assume a perfectly elastic collision this time. It sort of follows from this first one, but if I have no mass at the toe, then when I hit the ground, there's no dissipation at the toe. I've got a spring between me and the, and the ground and no mass that I'm going to rebound off the ground and bounce back up. Whereas all of our, our previous walking models, as soon as I hit the ground, I would dissipate all the energy and I would never bounce. I would just stick. This one's always going to bounce. It's an elastic collision. Okay. Um, these things together imply that energy is always conserved. I don't have any actuators in here. I don't have a jetpack or anything like this. If my command is just to move the leg, but the leg is massless, then that doesn't change the energy of the system, right? And if I were to, since this has got no inertia, so when I'm on the ground, if I were to be applying some torque there, it doesn't do any work either, okay? So there's no ability to do mechanical work in this system. The energy is going to be conserved always. I don't lose any energy at the impact, right? Energy is always conserved. So that should immediately be a red flag for some of you. Um, 
you know, do you think this system can be stable? Typically, an energy conserving system like our pendulum, our undamped pendulum was not stable, right? It would sit there going like this forever. We had to add some damping to actually make it stable. So this is a threat to stability. But as we'll see, there's some, some notion of stability is still possible. But this is a threat to stability. We'll come back to it. It, it, it implies that we're not going to be globally stable. For instance, if I were to go up and push the system in a way that added energy, then it can't ever push that energy back down to the original fixed point in energy. Right? So there's going to be some direction where this system is not passively stable. Okay, it's still a hybrid system. I'm going to have a different dynamic during the aerial phase as I have when I, when I stick to the ground. When I do stick to the ground, I'm going to assume a point mass. I mean a pin joint. This is the infinite friction. So again, we said that there's, there's reason to believe it shouldn't be stable, but I'd like to understand the long-term behavior of this system. If I were to go ahead and, and uh, start simulating it, I'd, I'd like to eventually write a controller which decides what the touchdown angle is um, when I'm in, you know, given some controller that's setting the touchdown angle, I'd like to understand the long-term behavior. But let's start by just saying that the touchdown angle is a constant. So when I'm on the ground, the leg's going to compress and go around like this. But as soon as I'm in the air, I, ha I can apply, I can set the touchdown angle arbitrarily, fast forward till the next time I touch the touchdown. So if I have the touchdown angle as my control, then for a constant touchdown angle, What's the long-term behavior of the system? Okay. Turns out it can have a periodically stable, with, some, with one caveat, but it, there, are, there is some notion of stability that, that comes out. And we're going to obtain that stability with Poincaré maps. Okay. So the total state of this thing is x, y, theta, plus potentially the derivatives, even though it's, it's, we, could, we argued that that derivative isn't important, okay. So where should I draw my, how can I do my Poincaré map? What's, my, what's a reasonable surface of section? You could pick many, there's not a right answer yet, except that in, there is a right answer in this particular analysis because it's, uh, we can make a, a simpler analysis, but um, I could choose, for the rimless wheel, we chose the moment of touchdown, right? And we did the whole map around the periodic cycle defined by when the foot hit the ground. In this case, it's gonna be easier to actually do it when I'm in the air. So the apex to apex map. The reason for that is even though this is a six dimensional system state, it turns out I can, in, at the apex, given, a few, given the constant energy assumption, I can describe the apex with a single variable. Okay? Why? So if x is x, y, theta, x dot, y dot, theta dot, we just argued that theta and theta dot sort of are inconsequential. I can move them arbitrarily. And in particular, at the in the in the air, I'm going to assume that the leg is servoed exactly to my constant touchdown angle. Okay, so those don't need to be part of our analysis. I'm going to forget about where I am in in the 
in space, I can sort of ignore this, right? These are uh, don't care for now. So what I really want to understand is the stability in y, x dot, and y dot. The apex is defined as when y dot equals zero, right? That's what I'm at the top and about to go back down. So this one equals zero. That gives me now two variables that I potentially have to reason about. But since I know the total energy of the system, given the initial condition, I can figure out what x dot has to be as a function of y dot. Of y, sorry. If I started the system with energy 14, and I say I'm at the apex right now, and my apex is at you know a meter off the ground, then that implies that I must have a certain horizontal velocity for that energy to hold. Okay? So given the energy is fixed, I can write my entire map in terms of y. Does that make sense? So I can do y at the n plus one apex is some Poincaré map from y at the nth apex. And that map is going to depend on my command. Let me call it alpha. But alpha is my, here is theta touchdown. Well, I guess I can call it u. We've been calling it u. Magic. Again, from the you know from this, even though it's a much higher dimensional system, I'm still going to be able to draw a one-dimensional map and talk about its stability, which means I can do it on the board. Okay. Is that clear? Yeah. In general, when we pick a map, do we have to prove that every train has to be able to go through that? Right now, we're just using camera. I'm actually going to. Um, We'll see it, it falls off. Not every state will revisit the map in this case. So I'm only going to be able to say things on the domain where that map returns. That's an awesome question. Right? We said that the, in order to have a stability property on the map, trajectories have to return to the map. You have to have that guarantee. And here we're going to have it locally, but not globally. P pretty globally, but just there, there, there's, a, there's some quirks. OK, so given this model, if I know where I am at the, at the apex at y, I'm going to simulate it forward, bonk, it'll come back up, and I know exactly, I know everything about the apex at the, uh, at the next, uh, the, the y value at the next apex. It's completely determined by the equations. Okay? That's, we're going to do that for now, and then we're going to do control by choosing the touchdown angle. But in this case, um, we will analyze for a fixed touchdown angle. Yeah? I guess maybe I'll even do it here. Okay. I want to give you the characteristic of the analysis. I won't do every equation, but the flight phase is simple, right? Um, in this case, X, the only thing that matters is the X, Y position, and X double dot is just this, maybe MG, sorry, do that, okay. So you can imagine that Solving in closed form for this, right? If I have a um, if I have a x dot and y dot initial conditions here, right? So I've got x dot at some y, x dot zero. Um, x doesn't really matter. I have y zero. Then I can just integrate this trivial double, you know, 
linear equation forward to figure out the condition, where is the mass going to be when the leg hits the ground, right? And if the leg, the angle is theta touchdown, then that's just a simple matter of integrating this equation forward until y equals L, y a touchdown is L cosine theta touchdown. We're going to assume that the leg is at its uh, rest length during the air, too. Right? So you can imagine simulating that forward with closed form. It's a few equations, um, but it, it comes out trivially. Okay. Now the stance phase. is more interesting. Now I've got a new system which has this dynamics like we just talked about here. I'm going to have a pin joint here. Theta now is part of the state and the um, radius r is part of the state. So in fact the minimal coordinates that are useful to think about here are, ac are r theta r dot theta dot. So there's this idea of having your models written in minimal coordinates. Yeah. Are the same as L up there? Yeah. So, um, yes. I chose it like this because it feels like it's polar coordinates here, but it's L. Yeah. There's something that people do in in hybrid systems. Okay, which is coming up here. I could write this system always as in the full coordinate system in x, y, theta, and then add, when I'm in the stance phase, add some constraint of the position of this thing and have a constrained differential equation, a DAE, okay? But for analysis reasons, it, we want to solve this out exactly and write the system in a minimal coordinates where it's an unconstrained state dynamics and more like our traditional Lagrangian. That means you have a different state, set of state variables in the air when you're on the ground, and you have to have a mapping when you have this, this contact event, you have to be able to map from the state at the touchdown event to the new state at the stance event. But that's totally reasonable here. That's just kinematics, okay? That's this notion of minimal coordinates. The, the other extreme is maximal coordinates where, um, some simulators, for instance, will simulate even a humanoid robot by saying every link is a floating joint and there's, they're held together, together by constraints which are, imply that the joints don't leave each other. They're connected by, by rigid bodies. Those simulators are easier to write, even easier to, to analyze, but they have, like when we were using someone else's simulator to compete for the DARPA simulated challenge, uh, simulating Atlas, our maximum walking speed was determined not by our controller, but by the point when the knees of the simul of the robot started, dis you know, dislodging from each other because the simulator wasn't doing a good enough job enforcing those constraints. And if you've ever used, for instance, Gazebo or some of these other simul simulators, a lot of times things will explode in dramatic fashion, which can include links of robots separating from each other, and that's sort of one of the problems of writing the maximal coordinates. Okay. Most, you know, the, the equations of motion that we use mostly in, um, in Drake are to use a floating base for the, um, for the body, but then minimal coordinates for the internal joints. But that, even that still would be complicated here. Here, we're going to change coordinates to a minimal coordinate so that when we're on the ground, we really drop the state space to the two-dimensional uh, two, two configuration variables, two velocities to describe the stance. 
Okay, so the stance dynamics are now just a rigid body system with a spring, you know, point mass with a pin joint here. That's something we can write with Lagrangian mechanics. Um, you know, it's, it's not hard at all. The equations come out to be, I just want to give you the characteristic of them here. Two equations of motion for that for that govern the polar coordinates of the center of mass. Okay, but unlike this one, which were trivial linear equations, which we could integrate forward to some terminal condition, this one is a nonlinear set of equations, which we don't have a closed form integral expression for. Okay, the terminal condition of stance is going to be defined by when the leg returns to the rest length, so it's going to compress, it's going to start at the rest length, compress, when it returns to the rest length, we'll say that it left the ground. So the leg is, has a finite extension there. It leaves the ground there. So we'd like to integrate these equations forward from whatever our initial condition here is at touchdown until we reach the threshold where r is r0 again. We can't do that in closed form here. So, but we can do it, and Geyer, so Hartmut Geyer um, gave us a linear analysis, convinced us of the value of, a, of the linearized analysis, let's say. If you linearize around the upright, which effectively is assuming that this deflection is relatively small and the angle that sweeps through is relatively small, then you take the linearization of that equation, even though there's r and theta appear in complicated terms, you can of course linearize it, sine looks like theta, cosine looks like one, and things simplify out to a linear set of equations that you can integrate forward in the same way we did uh, for the apex, or for the, for the aerial phase. And then you get another aerial phase. Which simulates from um, x0, y0, um, theta 0, theta dot 0 don't even matter, but I guess so x dot y dot zero to uh, y dot t apex equals zero. You can integrate those equations forward again, and that almost completely defines our map. Okay? This map is, is not the one that, that Hartmut Geyer decided to analyze because it doesn't have the same, the nice properties that we would expect. This linearization caused a defect where the true equations of motion, energy would be conserved, but in the linearization, energy was not conserved. So there's one last step in this analysis. Um, just you project it back to the system, to the um, to the height, which is consistent with the total energy. Okay, but this is a recipe now for having a closed form approximation because of the stance phase of our map from y from one apex to the next apex, and it's characteristic of the type of of analysis that you'll see in hybrid systems more generally, where you have to break down each individual mode, think about the, the dynamics through that mode up till the reset. So we have, a, we have a guard, 
In this case, there is no ch instantaneous change in the, in the state because there was no impact, but in the, remember in the rimless wheel, we had an instantaneous change in velocity. I then map to this coordinate system, I integrate forward until the event, I map back to the aerial phase, I integrate forward to the apex event, I do my little correction, that's the only discontinuity. Okay? If I do that, I can start, I can plot what's y as, as a function, uh, what's p as a function of y. You remember what the plot looked like for the rimless wheel, I hope it was beautiful, had stable fixed points. Okay. So if I plot y n versus y n plus one, remember for discrete systems, what I what's interesting is that's line of slope one, because a fixed point is where I get the same velocity after that I I started with. So it's anytime this the line crosses the, the, that line of slope one. Okay, if you plot this for some nominal parameters, some reasonable parameters of the slip model, you get a curve that looks like this. Okay, which has two fixed points. This one turns out is a stable fixed point, and this is an unstable fixed point. It's stable because if I start here, I go like this, I do my iterated map, I keep jumping forward, it actually does this sort of complicated thing here because the slope is negative there, but it will come to um, a stable hopping height for some angle, yeah? The thing that happens over here, you can you can sort of uh, bounce around and come back. This is okay. But the model, your question was right on, the model starts getting suspicious when y gets very close to the ground because the leg would get in the way. So it only makes sense even up till um, some minimum, which is L0 cosine theta touchdown. It's not well defined below that. And even at the end, you get some weird behaviors where you actually get to higher velocities first because you come down, um, you're, in order to have a constant energy and a low height, that means you have a high horizontal velocity and you come down, you go and you shoot off. Okay, so you get this weird where you, you go higher. Um, uh, let, me, let me say that more carefully in a second, okay? Over here is also very funny. Up here, it's, you might not return to your return map because the other failure mode is if you start off very high and you have a constant energy, that means you're not moving forward very fast. So you're moving slowly and it can be that your model will go like this. Come down and then just fall off this way and never return to the map. If you, if you come down with too slow of a horizontal velocity, you'll go like this. Okay, so it's poorly defined up here. But there's a huge swath of state space where it is defined. And surprisingly, this analysis says that there's a stable fixed point. Okay? So how can that possibly be true when energy is conserved? Yeah? It's moment cycle. You, you wouldn't expect a, a conservative system to be able to recover um, even on a, it shouldn't, it should not have limit cycle stability. I think that that is true. Does it explain the fact that we can call this a, a, a stable point? 
I have actually confused by your earlier statement. Why wouldn't you expect the conservatives to, to have like a simple pendulum right? that have simple? It can have. It'll have periodic solutions, but those solutions are not stable. If I were to perturb that solution by adding energy, for instance, it'll go forever to a new. It will not return to the original orbit. This system should have that same property. If I perturb it in energy, it shouldn't return. I've hidden that detail in this energy correction at apex. Okay? In fact, this system is unstable in energy in the same way, but sort of all of the other dimensions are stable. This is, it's, it, that sounds like it's just a trick. But this was enough to have like Phil Holmes and, and, and John Guggenheimer uh, write papers about the surprising properties of stability in piecewise holonomic systems, conservative systems, right? These are like classical dynamicists. When they were study working, they worked with Bob Full actually, talking about these slip models, and they wrote a series of papers about the surprising stability properties of piecewise holonomic systems, okay? so. It can be that a system that has discontinuities, even if it's energy conserving, can be stabilizing in many dimensions, in most of its dimensions, partially stabilizing. And this plot shows that off and was their canonical example. Okay, and in practice, when you simulate this, you will see convergence in every dimension except for, of course, this is, the Poincaré analysis hides two dimensions, right? There are actually two eigenvalues, two zero eigenvalues in the original, um, in the full state space. If I were to perturb it along, the, you know, across the surface of section, then of course that one, right? If it, in my Vanderpool oscillator or any any oscillator, if I right, I can perturb it here, and that's invisible to the Poincaré map. Right, if I perturb it along the, the trajectory, those points might never come to, will never come together on a limit cycle. And then this one also, in there's some dimension in energy, which I perturb it, I'll, I'll have a new energy cons conserving limit cycle. But in all of the other dimensions, it's actually stable. And this is perhaps the surprising result about, that, that makes a lot of these hopping robots tick. Um, it turns out to be surprisingly general. So um, not only I showed you the, the center of mass in the sagittal plane analysis that Bob did just now, that's what this is. He analyzed a lot of different um, systems at a lot of different scales and they all sort of fit the slip model and maybe that explains their inherent mechanical stability. But it actually also turns out to be true, he studied cockroaches in the uh, frontal plane, so in the lateral plane. It seems that they also have a center of the slip kind of dynamics in the lateral plane. So a sprawled cockroach, which has legs on both sides. It turns out if you perturb it in one direction, or even watch its center of mass dynamics along these, uh, you know, in the sagittal plane, it has the same sort of characteristic spring-like mechanics. And they did one of my favorite sets of experiments ever um, to try to understand exactly the response of the cockroach to perturbations in the lateral dimension. Okay, so put your experimentalist hat on for a second and just think, I've got a cockroach, you know, I'm, I'm allowed to do pretty much anything to them. That's one of the good things about cockroaches. Okay, so, so you, you don't have to, to get approval to do anything. So, so, and I want, but they're pretty small and they're pretty fast, right? Pretty resilient, but how am I going to perturb the cockroach to do an experimental study about the lateral stability of the cockroach? When it's a human, you give them a push, right? And it takes time, and you can use motion capture cameras, whatever. What do you do with a cockroach? Turns out, these, Devin Gindrich was the grad student at the time that was doing this work. He said, we started off, we tried little strings, and we'd pull the strings, right? And, but it, you couldn't pull fast enough. Like it, was like it was a very hard experimental problem. They actually also, in order to measure the ground reaction forces, they figured out this brilliant experimental technique where they would run the cockroach on jello with diffraction gradients on either side. And as the, as the 
cockroach put, you know, bent the jello, it would it would diffract the light, and you'd you'd get a measure of force by just having the jello deform as the cockroach was running. And I guess that worked really well, except for the cockroaches would eat the jello slowly. <laughs> and apparently, like or, they really like orange jello, is what he said. Um, okay, but but they did even better things for this lateral stability. It's like my, one of my favorite experiments. Oh, it stands up there with a the dead fish. It's one of my favorite experiments of all time. Okay. Turns out, uh, they basically you can bolt things to a cockroach. So what they decided to bolt to, a, to the cockroach here was a small cannon. Okay, a can <laughs> as the cockroach is running, you light the cannon, it goes off. You get an instantaneous perturbation, and you watch its recovery. Okay, and ask, it does it follow the open loop dynamics of sort of a spring mass model? Ready? Okay, here's the cockroach. Look carefully. There's a cannon strapped to its back. Right around here, you'll see. There goes the cannonball. And this one actually comes back and hits the cockroach. That's like a second perturbation. Okay. But what they found is that the recovery of the cockroach uh, in orientation takes a few steps. But if you watch the velocity of, of the, the the velocity vector of the center of mass, it recovers inside a single step. And they argued that it was faster than any possible neural, neural loop that could have possibly happen in the cockroach, so that its stability could only be explained as sort of an open loop mechanical stability. That maybe this sort of fundamental stability of the spring mass models is the governing stability of the cockroach. Yeah. Great. Let me just play that one more time. That's classic. Devin's a good guy. So, um, I, when I was talking to him about this, I was fascinated when I first heard about this, right? He, um, he made some little side comment, which I, I might be interpreting as more than it was, but, but he said something about how it was surprising how little gunpowder it takes to perturb the cockroach. And that just, for me, implies that there were a series of experiments <laughs> where the cockroach would just go, you know, and just, or just, you know, like, I don't know exactly what those first experiments looked like, but, you know, I'm, I'm guessing they were fun. Okay. Um, so, fundamental uh, property of, of self stabilizing locomotion in running uh, with these slip models. A key idea. But what I really want to talk about is control. So um, how would you do slip control? So if I have my dynamics governed by um, this spring-like uh, spring mass model, and I have the opportunity to control, first of all, in this model, control means um, choosing theta touchdown. during each aerial phase. Right? So, um, keeping my Poincaré analysis intact now, I put the subscript down below to just imply it was a constant before, but now let me think about this as a, lin as a, um, a potentially nonlinear map. We linearized it there. That maps one apex to the next apex, but it depends on the theta touchdown, right? So then I'll call it un. This is fundamentally different than the type of control we've done so far, where we have a continuous control over the entire cycle, potentially, or over an entire trajectory. Here we have fundamentally discrete control. I only make, to make a decision once per cycle. And that decision is where, what the angle is I'm going to put my leg down. So I'm effectively deciding my touchdown location or touchdown angle. And the question is, can I use this to make this more stable? Move the fixed point? You know, all the classical questions. So there's a couple different ways to do that control. Okay. So we want to design a controller. We want to maximize stability for some y desired. Make it a fixed point and maximize its stability. Okay, so there's a number of ways we can do it. 
First of all, if we can find a U that makes Y desired a fixed point, here's it, idea number one. Then we can linearize the system P around Y desired U star and do LQR, right? Discrete time LQR has a slightly different form than the, it, it's a, it's got a different Riccati equation, the discrete um, Riccati equation, but uh, it's basically the same characteristic. It's solvable in the same way as the continuous time LQR. So for a discrete time system, you know, And a cost function, I can, an infinite horizon cost function, I can write the LQR controller. And that's what I can get by linearizing P. So that's cool. So for a walking system, I mean, sometimes we talk about discrete time systems as approximations of a continuous time system, like we did that in MPC, um, just because we're computing at some fixed time steps. But this one is a different type of discretization. There's a natural discretization, which is I'm gonna make a decision once per footstep. Okay, and it gives me this really fundamentally discrete system on the Poincaré map, and I can stabilize it with linear control. But there's a second idea that's very powerful um, that is unique to discrete time systems. And that's deadbeat control, okay? So discrete time systems can do something that a continuous time system can't. A continuous time system always will take some amount of time to get to the origin. A discrete time system has the opportunity to get to the origin on a single step. There are finite control inputs, which can move the system from some non-zero state to the origin in a single step. It doesn't happen in continuous time, right? It would take infinite input to do that, but it does happen with finite input for discrete time systems. So in this, what it could mean is if that P is invertible, right? then I'm going to choose as my function u of n is somehow this, the, the p, I want, I want the output of p inverse to be y desired. Right? Can I write it like that? But it's, it is the u which, which makes this possible. It's a function of y n and it So I can just look at the map, which I just erased, right? And I can say, for, I've got slightly different maps for each U, right? The, the way the map changes as a function of U. But if I have those maps, and I have a goal of being here on the next step, I can look at wherever I am at Y and choose the curve which crosses the line exactly at that, in one step. It turns out that these maps for the slip models are invertible. And I can always choose, it's not, I, I don't want it to get lost in the algebra here, it's, it's simple enough. I can always choose the touchdown angle such that when I go through the stance one time, I'll come out exactly at the Y that I, I want. Right? There's always a touchdown angle I can choose 
so that after one hop, I'm exactly at the, the, the fixed point. That's a cool idea. It's potentially, right, this would give me some, um, some exponential convergence to that fixed point. This one gives me a finite time. It's zero time, you know, one, one time step convergence to the fixed point, if it exists. It's a powerful idea. But even better, the slip model, Hartmut, uh, um, who studied this a lot, realized that um, this map is also unimodal, okay, in the sense that um, if I were to touch down, if, if there, it happens that there is a leg angle, let me see if I can explain this well. If my goal is to get to a certain height, if I were to touch down right now, there's a leg angle I'd want. If I'm going to touch down in a moment, there's a slightly different leg angle I'd want. So the, the, where I am as a function of y is going to change my leg angle. So if I go to implement this on a real robot, that's annoying, right? Because I have to know what y is relative to the ground in order to solve that equation. It turns out if I were to, to just pretend that the, um, the, the, my foot is on the ground right now and set my leg angle at that angle, but then as y continues to evolve down, I continue to change the leg angle so that if, the, if I were to hit the ground right now, I would pop up at the, exactly the right height. Then you can actually sweep your leg through while you're in the air, have no knowledge of where you are relative to the ground, but whenever you happen to hit the ground, you'll be at exactly the right leg angle so that you come up and go to that desired height. Did I say that well enough? You can imagine sweeping your leg through so that whenever I happen, you're completely blind. I have no idea how high I am, but as soon as I hit the ground, I'm gonna be at exactly the right leg angle so that boom, I'm up on the, on the very next height. At the very next step, I'm at the right height. So this system is not only stable when you know why, but it can be open loop stable if you have no measurement of the terrain. Awesome. So the sort of cartoon for that from Hartmut is this deadbeat control for a slip model that has no idea where the ground is. Okay, maybe the foot went through the ground there. There's some caveats, but uh, um, it always stabilizes the desired height with no knowledge of the terrain. Okay, so the problem is you can't actually build that, right? Um, we're gonna, you'll, you'll see that the, their attempts to build that looked a little bit like this. This was actually built by okay, Fumia, uh, Aida. Um, they built some simple models like that. Um, <clears throat> but they also went on to build, to show that the connections between these slip models and multiple legs are actually pretty beautiful. And in fact, there's a, there's a continuum, it seems, between the spring mass models and the compass gate models that I showed you last time. So if you put a second leg on and you have them both um, having springs in there, then if your spring stiffness is relatively low, then your center of mass trajectory gives you a running gate. But that same model started at a different energy and with a stiffer spring can actually give you a characteristic walking gait once you have two legs, right? So I think the nicest connection of all these is these spring mass models that can both walk and run. You can also actually build things like this. Oh, let me... Uh, let me let, give that a small intro. So, so um, uh, one of the best running, one of the fastest running robots ever is actually a rimless wheel, which was built almost like what we talked about, um, that has a little bit of control input. To, it, it has a dangling center of mass that it pulls forward. And uh, using these sort of ideas can actually run open loop stable, okay? And that's called this hex runner. It was called fast runner at various times. Oh, let me, Johnny is uh, incredibly, how do I hide this? On Thursday, May 22nd in Pensacola with Discovery. 
on Thursday, May 22nd in Pensacola with Discovery Channel filming. We made a successful launch at 1.52 p.m. of the large hex runner and it went to world record speed for a robot demonstrating stability and the concept that stability at these speeds is geometric, not a matter of traditional control methods. So with the Vast Runner project, we're trying to show that it is indeed possible to do really fast, efficient, graceful running using very little feedback. With most running and walking robots, we have a lot of sensors and about a thousand times a second we read what the sensors are doing, do a lot of computation to figure out what the actuator should be doing, and then send a desired current or torque or um, command to the actuators. And we have to do that really quickly or the robot will fall down. Um, as opposed to that with the hex runner and the fast runners, everything is done mechanically using springs and um, linkages. All the feedback mechanisms happen physically. So instead of having to do a lot of computation and have a lot of sensing, as you squeeze the throttle on your RC remote, it speeds up the motor, gives more power to the motor, and just based on the dynamics and the geometry of the mechanism, the robot's stable. Pretty cool, huh? And they go up to like, uh, I forget which one, the big one, they have a small one and a big one, but the original goals of the project were like 50 miles an hour. That's pretty awesome. <clears throat> okay, questions about slip? So it turns out it's not that far to go from the slip model to the Raybert hoppers that we talked about before. Right, so the Raybert hoppers were, are a slightly more complicated version of this. Once you have inertia in the legs, which a real robot does, you have to think about the actual mechanics of swinging your leg forward. Okay, um, but these were the the robots that, if you remember the the picture of them here. Sorry to walk back and forth. They look like this: Ser a series of highly successful hopping robots. Okay. They were actually built in order to simplify the control. The mechanics of those, like I said before, were actually very cleverly designed with the inertia. There's big masses at the end of the, um, at the end of those, that rod, so that there's a relatively large inertia of the body relative to the leg when it's in the air, so that when you applied a torque at the, at the um, hip, if you're in the air, you can basically ignore the effect that that has on the attitude of the robot and think about your leg being able to con being controlled continuously. Okay? And then in the ground, they actually have a big, so there was a hydraulic torque actuator here. And there was a pneumatic actuator through the leg here, down to the foot. where the pneumatic gave some springness, springiness by default, and then by injecting energy, you could then uh, add energy into the system, right, by pushing air in. But if you just capped off both ends of the cylinder, then you have an air spring, okay? And at a, at a time where we didn't know, you know, I think we knew a lot about control, but we didn't know a lot about how to control legged robots, uh, Raybert and the, and the students of the Leg Lab came up with a surprisingly simple set of controllers. It even sort of predated SLIP. And some the roboticists thinking about the SLIP model were actually trying to figure out why the heck Raybert's controller worked so well. And that's when the models, the mathematical modeling of SLIP started up. But um, Raybert observed, very simply, I guess, that if I, if I have the legs straight up and down, and uh, I just, I, I, I drop the pogo stick, then if I have the, the valve closed, it'll just hop at a constant height, losing a little bit of energy maybe every time, but that's a small loss. 
If I want it to hop higher, I'll push a little energy, push a little air into the cylinder, right at takeoff. Okay, and and even though the curve between the amount of air I push into the cylinder and the resulting hopping height is kind of potentially complicated, it's monotonic. So Raybert just said, yeah, I would get it hopping at a certain height, and if it was too low, I'd just turn it up a little bit. And if I was too high, I'd turn it down a little bit, okay? So he decomposed control into hopping height with just a, new, uh, a push of pneumatic air at touch off. Independent of that, of regulating that hopping height, he'd think about how fast do I want to be going, and he would use foot placement to regulate the speed of the robot. So if I'm going to, if I, so you can imagine sort of, let's see, uh, foot touchdown to regulate speed. And he did basically an early version of this stance phase analysis, which says that there's, given whatever speed I'm at, there's some magical angle which I can compute where I'm gonna be completely symmetric around that angle. I'll go down, I'll come back at exactly the same velocity. That's something that's easy enough to compute, is the magic touchdown angle that'll keep me going at the same speed. If I wanna go a little faster, I should put my foot down a little sooner than that. Right, because then I'll, I'll have a trajectory that looks more like this. If I want to go a little slower, then I'll trade some of my kinetic energy for potential energy. I'll put my foot down a little farther, and I'll have a trajectory that goes like this. And then I'll kill some of my horizontal speed. So he wrote a simple linear controller on foot position and a PD controller around the hip to servo the angle and said, when I'm in the air, I'm just going to pretend that torque at the hip servos the angle, and I'm going to use this simple uh, spring-loaded pendulum kind of analysis to figure out where I should put my foot. Okay? That was part two. And the magic of uh, that worked well because he made the robot have large inertia around the legs. Otherwise, that would be a too simple of assumption. And then the third part was in stance, he would try to repair any damage that he had done to the attitude of the robot by applying a torque at the hip to round out the, the attitude of the robot. So he would assume that when I'm on the ground, the earth has infinite inertia and I'm connected to it. So torques here would only affect the attitude. That's not quite true. Of course, the leg angle is coupled. Okay, but it's, it was true enough that a simple PD controller during stance to try to correct the set point of the body worked. Okay, and that led to not only successful hopping of this with some notion of foot, of foot step placement and, and the like already baked in, but to a, a hugely successful series of robots um, that I think you all know the final versions of these, right? But um, first off, you get to play with little models of this on your problem set. This is the, the hopper model that we'll give you, okay, or a slightly different rendering of it. But, but this is then the experimental models that he went on to build. He did the same thing with two legs. He has a, a great paper saying running on four legs as though they were one, or two legs or four legs as though they were one, where you basically just take turns with your legs, otherwise thinking about it exactly like the one leg system. If you have four legs, you can cu couple two of them together and you can get all kinds of different gates. If you couple the front two and the back two and think about those two as, as though they were one leg at a time, then you get this um, bounding gate. This is in early 80s, right? If you couple the diagonals, you get the, the more classical galloping gate. Awesome. And all this work, I mean, all this work with incredibly simple control. This, I, you know, I think a lot of people who had done legged robots, um, the results that they were 
we're, we're talking about was actually were frustrating to the controls community, like you're just doing ad hoc stuff. But somehow Raybert did, did stuff that was so intuitively simple that everybody loved it. Even the control theorists loved it. Um, it's, it's magical. Those controllers, I mean, they've, they've got some slightly different mathematical components, including a lot of optimization in the guts these days. But those controllers went on to be the driving force behind the robots that Boston Dynamics is doing now. This is the progression, if you haven't seen it. So I was sitting, I was a student sitting in the leg laboratory, um, hanging out with those guys, hacking on a humanoid. The day that Mark Rabert came back, he had started Boston Dynamics as a software company, came back to the lab, looked around a little bit, he's like, there's this huge hydraulic treadmill that they had used to do the backflips earlier. He's like, you guys using that? Uh, why? He's like, well, we're going to start doing robots at Boston Dynamics. Uh, I guess the rest is history. But this was the first sort of successful robot, the big dog. And by all accounts, um, the foot placement strategies that they used to do recovery for things like that in Big Dog were based on the original Hopper type analysis. And this just foot placement in order to stabilize your center of mass. They were huge, you know, huge, loud, annoying things, but uh, there's something cool about that. Okay, and then they went on to do high speed running. This is Wildcat. It's like, you know, this is spot, electric, quiet, and totally plausible moving around in unconstrained environment. You know, this is, this is the robot, the, the first video I saw them put out that I thought, it seems like a practical thing to have. It's a practical thing, you know? Remotely piloted in this case with the joysticks not telling them where to where the robot should walk and all the gates figured out. It's supposed to be inspection. A yep. little bit of train perception, but a lot of robustness. Even in this robot, when you look at this robot, you, you should see that those legs are wicked light. All of the Boston Dynamics robots, the legs are wicked light. And it's, so it dates back to this initial idea that you can, this control is simpler when you don't have to worry about the initial function of your center of mass. It's totally simple. Um, okay, so we'll talk more. Uh, of course, there, like I said, there is actually a lot more optimization hidden in that now. Mark might not admit it. Mark Rebert might not admit it. But, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, a lot of people who work on in his company now took this class at some point, right? So uh, they at least had to learn optimization for the midterm at one point. Um, but uh, we'll talk about the optimization tools that power this starting on Thursday. See you then. Um, a couple of questions. So you mentioned that the 